Hello and welcome everyone to the Orange Road. So, time for another weekly update. Uh, I want to look at um, the update from the behind the scenes blog about weapons because I think it's an interesting update and it's a uh, nice news you want to start this uh, weekly update with. Um, it's been posted by Calcutain and it's like I said about the weapons. You can find it by the way in the blog section but I just want to talk about it. It's for the second edition as well. So first up, hand weapons. Um, no surprise, hand weapons are pretty much going to be exactly as they were. Uh, one big difference is, is that you can uh, give a magical enchantment, but we'll talk about that one later. Then we get great weapons. Uh, they've got plus two strength, plus two armor piercing, and always strike at initiative zero. You can't use a shield, so not really any change here at all, um, which I think is a good way to start with the new edition, keeping most of the rules, even though they have a different setup, uh, similar to they, how they were, so we don't have to actually relearn the entire game again. But then we get something else, um, we get the Halbert, and it also has plus one strength and plus one armor penetration, and you can't use a shield. So still, no real changes. Uh, then we get Lance Attack, uh, you get Thunderous Charge with it, so plus 2 Strength, plus 2 Armor Penetration, and Infantry cannot use them. Light Lance is also pretty much the same, plus 1 Strength, plus 1 Armor Penetration. There is a big change with this by the way, but we'll talk about this one later. But here we get a real big change, the, the Paired Weapons. So you still get plus 1 Attack when you're using Paired Weapons. But you also get plus one offensive skill, and you ignore parry. And again, you can't use a shield um, when using paired weapons. Now, a lot of people probably prefer the plus one initiative, because hey, it's probably better than the plus one offensive skill. But I really like that they ignore parry. Um, I've been playing with a really big block of the ghouls, with the uh, Atalius Teeth Vampire hero in there. And I've seen so many things just bounce off thanks to the parry. Especially uh, high quality units like Warriors of the Dark Gods and um, Chosens of Lust. They go in and they just lose so many damage output because of parry. So units with a very high uh, weapon skill or offensive skill as it's now known will probably really, really be glad with the, the change in the setup of paired weapons. Then we get the Spears, who have also had quite a change. So you still get fight and extra rank, yeah, but now you get plus one armor penetration base. And if somebody charges you and you can uh, you can take the charge, you get an additional plus one armor penetration. That's really nice to start with. So a plus two armor penetration on a spear gives your, your core units a real big chance against heavy armor units. I prefer it better than Lethal Strike, to be honest. But there's also something else, you get plus 2 agility in the first round of combat, provided you haven't charged and it's in your front. Yeah. So, uh, one thing you should probably recognize is that if you charge anyway, you get plus 1 initiative. But because the spears get plus 2 in, uh, agility, because initiative has become agility, you now still if you have relatively the same stats, you go first with the spear, which I really like. Uh, I think it's it's flavorful, and I think it will give some really interesting combinations when using spears. So yeah, I really like this one. Uh, there's also a special note, Devastating Charge and Thunderous Charge, they've been merged. You just get Devastating Charge and whatever it does for your unit. So plus one strength or plus one attack, lethal strike. Uh, I think it's a, a decent change. Um, I always forget what <laughs> devastating charges and what thunderous charges. Now I can just see devastating charge and then between the brackets what it does. So uh, there's more in this article here. Um, let's look at the more interesting stuff. Uh, where are the flails? Right, uh, we've removed the flails. So if you had flails, you probably now have great weapons. A lot of people in our staff thought the option wasn't really used anyway, uh, mostly only in very few specific armies in our characters. Vermin Swarm were the exception to this, so hey, 
they're gonna keep their plague flails so yay you'll probably see that with more weapon options if an army really really has a specific use for it even though we remove it from the main book it will probably just be a part of the army specific book uh, then we have a part about why we haven't changed the the stats on the great weapons and the spears it's it's an interesting reading here pretty much it's just all about balance uh, if you give them a lower strength and more armor piercing you really change the dynamic uh, of the weapon options i like the current setup um, we'll have to see if if paired weapons are still as popular as they were now i think they will but we'll have to see but yeah that's pretty much the reason um, why we haven't changed that much uh well, let's see next thing interesting so why are we chasing the spear rules i just talked about this it's the the bonus on the initiative if you get charged the lethal strike was always a bit hit or miss and only against certain units uh, the despair is now a more all-around weapon which i think will will make it be seen even more on the battlefield uh pair of weapons already talked about that as well what are the new rules for parry? Let's see. So, um, now we have the offensive and the defensive uh, skill change. So, what used to be weapon skill is now two different stats on your block. This made the old parry not really work. So, they've, it goes in here why they've changed it. But, it pretty much means that you either get plus one defensive skill, if you have parry. Or, your defensive skill is equal to their offensive skill so whatever is better so this means that they will always hit you on a four plus well pretty much stays the same unless they have paired weapons of course it also means that if you have a really high defensive skill let's say you're playing dwarfs because uh, dwarfs are good in defending themselves you get plus one so you could get to the case where your your dwarf with defensive skill four just saying number if he has a shield, he now has the defensive skill of 5, meaning that if he's attacked by a really low uh, offensive skill unit, they hit you on more than a 4, probably a 5 or something. So yeah, great. Uh, you can also use parry now with magical weapons, which makes sense to me. I've always hated that parry didn't work with magical weapons. So, because my sword is magical, my shield is magical, I suddenly forget how to use my shield as a block. I mean, you don't want to scratch your fancy magical shield. Uh, then we have uh, another part here about the weapon enchantments. And uh, what they did, they added a list of uh, examples. This is just the, the work in progress so far. And if I'm correct, these are just the, the basic weapons in the main rulebook. We'll have way more um, enchantments in all the different armies. So but this is just the basic. Let's start with the Might of Titans. Um, you get plus 3 strength and magical attacks. Really, really standard. You can take this on a great weapon, which does make it interesting. Then you're looking at plus 5 strength. Probably not really need it. I mean, <laughs> if you already have a strength of 4 as a respectable hero model, having strength 7 is good enough. Strength 9 might be a bit overkill. But hey, it's a way you can go. Uh, the blessed inscription used to be the blessed sword divine attacks and reward to fail to wounds kingslayer um i think this is an, a weapon that, an enchantment at least it is it's the one that gives you plus strength plus armor penetration plus attack value when you're attacking an existing number of enemy characters in base contact with your unit um i used to love this item but I think the, the time of units with 4 or 5 characters in them have long, long disappeared. So, not really sold on this one anymore. But it's still here. Might suit your meta. Uh, then you get the, uh, the Razor Edge. Plus 6 armor penetration. Really, really nice. Um, can always wound better than 3+. Plus, also great. Uh, then we have the Hero's Blade. Um, it, it's a really good one if you have crappy heroes and... A lot of my army have <laughs> crappy heroes. It gives you an extra attack, uh, your magical attacks, and you at least have strength 5, AP 3. Great on an Emperor, I go. Uh, Blade of Power. This seems new to me. Plus 1 strength, plus 1 armor, armor penetration, uh, magical attacks. 
Uh, strength modifiers from the weapon combined mundane weapon helmet cannot exceed plus two. Right, probably in a, a cheaper way to um, increase your weapon. Supernatural dexterity plus two offensive skill plus two agility. Probably really nice on um, guys with already high offensive skill and agility. And usually when I have a hero with lower stats, I don't really want to boost the offensive skill and agility. I pretty much prefer having more raw damage output, so more attacks or more strength. But on the elf guy, this might get really ridiculous uh, with these stats. And then we have Lightbringer. Uh, let's see, at the start of each round of combat, the wielder may choose to give attacks made with enchanted weapon during round of combat. Flaming attacks and magical attacks. Alright. Seems uh, pretty basic. So yeah, this was the latest block. I, I thought it was um, worth it to uh, just, just go through it and have a nice little look. Really interested in these changes. And uh, yeah. Something else. I just saw Pelican post about the layout of the new um, unit cards or unit entries, whatever you want to call them. I thought, yeah, I didn't mention it in the previous video about weapon options, so... Let's have a look at what everything was and what everything will be, etc, etc. So this is the new layout, at least uh, a work in progress layout. It's really different. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not the biggest fan of this layout, um, even though I did <laughs> give feedback before. I don't like change, I'll be honest. Um, the other executive board members often make fun of me and my my tendency to not want to see anything changed, but yeah, we <laughs> those people are also part of the community, so I'll try my best to uh, look over it. So the one thing I do like is that you have a quick look in the top right, what the size is, what the type is, and what the base is. If you're playing with your own army, you know this, but it's handy if you give your, your arm pick to your opponent, you can just, oh yeah, carefully uh, standard, uh -huh. it's quite handy. So let's let just look at what we have here. So global, the AD, that's the um, the advance rate. MA is the march rate, what used to be march, so that's the maximum you can go. Then we have DI, which is what um, used to be the leadership. I should have a look at <laughs> what DI means. I, I've been working now with a lot of uh, s uh, uh, shorthand and I even I start to forget stuff it's discipline yeah that was the one uh, defense well defensive skill uh, then we have re which is resilience which used to be toughness uh, s is armor safe same as was then we have special safe I know special safe is something we still are looking for a better name I, I had the idea for Aegis for example but yeah I'm uh, a role-playing nerd. I don't think everybody knows what the term Aegis is, unless you're really into role-playing games. Uh, HP, uh, it's the uh, alternative for wounds. I think that does make it a bit easier for um, new people coming in. Hits points, everybody knows what those are. Then we have the offensive layout, so the OF, the offensive skill, uh, still weapon skill part. Strength 4, yeah, it is what it was. AP for armor piercing, the attack for the attack rating, and agility instead of initiative. So new names, uh, new layouts. Like it or hate it, this is probably the way we're gonna go. I will not be surprised if we change the layout a bit more and in the meantime, you never know. I've already had a discussion with a couple of guys who think this is a lot better. It's just the way your brains process the information. I like reading uh, from left to right, and then other people prefer other layouts, so yeah, this is what it is. Uh, the combined profile will look like this. Um, yeah, like I said, my brains have, <laughs> well my brain, don't have brains, don't collect them or anything. My own brain has a bit of trouble with this, but that's probably mostly just me. I do think if you get used to this, it will probably be a lot easier to look at. 
So I just wanted to add this um, oh because right. I was talking For about my third the and weapon upgrade and subject some of the something the which new I usually threat. don't really like doing. But I'm gonna do it anyway, because it's almost the end of version 1.3. So I thought if I don't do it now, I'll don't do it ever. I'm gonna talk about which armies I think are the weakest and which ones are the strongest. But I'm gonna go at it from a different direction. I'm not gonna look at how powerful the armies are in the hands of the best players. Because that's not what my channel is for. My pl my channel is more about the the average fun-loving tournament goer. Um, at least that's, that's how I feel about it. And there's a big dis the big difference between the best players in the world and those who just um, play at home or sometimes pick a tournament just want to have fun. And certain armies can be really powerful in the hands of a really good general. But those kind of lists just will not work for the average Hey, I want to have a couple of beers and have some fun and roll some dice guys So that's the the input, uh, that's the angle I'm looking at this So the ease of play is pretty important So uh, I'm gonna start with the bottom um, I had a good, <laughs> I had to take a good think about this I'm going to go for Dread Elves Even though there are a couple in the low tiers that might also sh could also be here. I could have also put the Dread Elves with the low tier, but I wanted to just add them separately. Uh, why? Why the Dread Elves? I'm not talking that the, the book itself is weak, but when I'm playing in my own meta, um, Dread Elves are almost completely gone. Let's start with that. I think it's the rarest army now in my scene by a long, a long shot. I've played them perhaps twice the last year on just casual play and I play about let's say three games uh, let's say two games per week on average roughly so yeah not seeing a uh, dread at all is a good indicator uh, when I do play against them uh, the lists just don't work I do think you can still like I said I do think you can build a competitive arm with the dread elves. But I think for the average tournament goer, the list is pretty rough to work with. The The cult system is not the easiest setup. The army is really fragile, but it also lost some of its mobility. You really have to plan ahead. And I think that's the reason why the Dread Elves are just not seeing uh, any success at the moment. Okay, give me your feedback, guys, in the comment section if I'm completely wrong. But as I said... I had to put someone in the, the in the bottom, and I went for the Dread Elves. So then we have the low tier. Um, these are not in any specific order. I put the Kingdom of Equity in there. Uh, for the very simple reason is... The army is not easy to play... If you play the Kingdom of Equity as you should with Knights. Uh, I'm not a fan of the Peasant list. I think the Peasant list is is easier to play... Still not really a popular option, I think, with the Kingdom of Equity players, because one, it's boring. Uh, two, you need a lot of models, which you probably will not have as a Kingdom of Equity player. And three, you will not win big with a, a peasant list. And I'm talking about the more average player, they're, they're not looking to play for a draw. So I think the Kingdom of Equity book is really, really rough to play with for the, the average um, laid-back guy. I mean... If you're playing with knight units, you don't have a lot of spare units, and it's just rough. Then we have the Empire of Sunstall. And I also spelled it wrong, I see. No, who cares. So, uh, let's talk about Hermenard. Hermenard has a list. Um, it works for him. It's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's an amazing list. The Village Idiot list. I also played against someone recently who tried a similar list, and he didn't have the, the skill level to use the list, and it was a disaster. Um, literally a disaster. It's not an easy army list to play. Then you can build a lot of different styles with the Empire. I, I've, I've had a lot of fun playing a knight, bu knight build. You can take an infantry build. But it's still not really an easy army to play. You need the synergy, so you need to have a somewhat decent list. And you also really, really need... Just, just like with the Kingdom of Ecutine, you need to plan ahead. And I think that's... Uh, more difficult than the lists that are up here. 
I also think that a lot of units in the Empire of Sunstall are not as balanced internally as I would like to see. I think there are some really standout options point-wise and power level-wise, and some units which are just less. Uh, that's the reason why it's in the low tier. Then we get to the Furman Swarm. Furman Swarm, it's a bit of the same like the Kingdom of Aquitaine. I think you can build really solid lists with the Furman Swarm if you want to play a diehard list. But if you just want to play school Furman Swarm, is that what I like to call it, with just uh, big blocks of of slaves and just some shooting and stuff like that, you're you're gonna have a problem. A different problem with list is that scoring is a bit rough unless you go for the footpad option, for example. But again, those are not the kind of lists your, your, your laid back average tournament player wants to use or casual player. So, yeah, I think Furman Swarm became a more difficult army than it used to be, with also reduced leadership, etc. Um, you can no longer shoot in combats the way you used to be able to do as easily. So, I think it's just a more tricky army to use. That's why, hey, again, low tier. And there are also not a lot of standout units in the Furman Swarm book. Yeah, you have the Plague Disciplines who are really nasty, but that means you're building a list around it. Then we get Sylvan Elves. So, a lot of people in my in my um, meta play with Sylvan Elves. Uh, we have two guys here that can actually really play with them. Uh, I won't call their names because I don't want to stroke their ego, but they're really good. The other players with the Sylvan Elves are of less quality. Um, it's it's an army that really struggles against Pyromancy at the moment, especially if you're an average player. You just brought some stuff, and you're like, yeah, let's play, and then <laughs> Scorching Self, oh, half the army dies because you didn't plan ahead for the range of Scorching Self, etc., etc. You forgot to dispel the spell, etc. This makes the army really sensitive for some magical feedback, uh, as to say. Also, I don't think that the army itself is... It has less of the standout units. Yeah, you have the sword dancers who are, who are awesome, and the characters set up as well. But those are more specific builds. And the the army uh, categories are, are tricky to use. Um, you have only so much you can take from each selection, and picking the right ones is really important with the Sylvan Elves. Again, it's an army that's really about um, great deployment, great movement, range damage, and I just think this makes it an, a more difficult army to play. Then we get to the middle tier. Oh boy. Probably the the tier most people will, <laughs> will not agree on me on. Warriors of the Dark Gods. Why is it not in the strong tier? Because a lot of people play it over here and they have success with it. The reason is that I've I haven't lost against the Warriors of the Dark Gods in a long while. Um, this also influences my opinion on the army. Of course, I've played uh, I played them once in the tournament. So I just borrowed a friend's army, and I, I won the tournament. So <laughs> it's it's not a weak book. I mean, it's just just. An idiot like me can play it, but um, I do think the army is relative easy to play, which is why it's in the middle tier. There are a couple of really standout units, the, the Chosen of Lust for example. The reason why it's not in the strong tier is pretty much that it's not that easy um, to use, because you lack certain parts in your army, you have less shooting, you have less magic, and you're really, really connected to the combat phase. If you're playing in a game where the combat phase is not going to win you the game, you have to be really careful. You have to deploy differently, you have to perhaps combo charge, stuff like that. And I see a lot of people making mistakes in that part. As soon as the opponent just doesn't walk into the army or tries to run away from them, they struggle. So that's why I put it in the middle tier. Then we have the Undying Dynasties. I personally think the book is stronger than the middle tier. Uh, I think it should be in the strong tier. But again, it's not really a popular army. I also don't see a lot of people on the internet uh, making videos about it. There's less tactical discussion about it. Um, I do know that, for example, England it's, a, in England, it's a really popular army. It's not really popular over here. Um, 
pretty rare to see an Undying Dynasty player. Also, the nature of uh, an undead army makes it for some people more difficult to use, you can't flee, etc. And you still have that nasty weakness with the Hierophant. If he dies, the army starts crumbling. Even though the vampires are way up there, but <laughs> I'll explain that one later. I do think the the it's a weakness for the average player. You really have to protect the the Hierophant. You can also it's also an army that makes it's 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 susceptible for damage. Uh, it doesn't heal as fast as I, at least in my opinion. You pay a bit more for the units, but it is a really powerful army. That's why I put it in the middle tier. I think there are a couple of really standout picks and. I think it's an easy an army that you can also build a relatively easy um, all-round list with. Then we get to the Saurian Ancients. Um, why are they in the middle tier? I've played them a lot uh, in 2017 and I just couldn't get the army to work. I, I, I just struggled. Quite certain what that is. It's my also my own playstyle. I'm not really a fan of the really skirmishy but I do think the army is solid it's 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 a decent army it does have a tendency in my eyes to lose point playing it's not an army that will will easily get a 20-0 unless you're going for the extreme cowboy builds etc I think it has everything you need so I think it's a solid middle tier army um, I cold blood makes me strong the proc also really helps you have a decent magic phase you have decent board groups he'll put them up put them put them somewhere Goblins, middle tier, oh my god. Probably a lot of players will <laughs> disagree on me with that, especially the orcs and goblin players themselves. Why is it middle tier? Of one, I always have a feeling I'm playing as orcs and goblins. It doesn't matter what my opinions, it will always be something, sometimes something ridiculous, something wacky. But they, the, the army is key really very, you can, can really change your army around for your playstyle. I also think that on its own, the book is pointed correctly. Um, are certain units they are all well balanced. The internal balance isn't that great. The external balance, though, I think is is, is not nice. going to be a problem. With. It's probably the power that most armies should be compared to. But it is an army, like I said, that has many options. The characters are decent. You can go cheap. You can go expensive. It has a relative easy um, way to play because you can just go for bows. And Pyromancy, some war machine, some big blocks. So yeah, that's why I've put it in the middle tier. It's just a great all-round army. Then we get to the dwarven holds, and oh yeah, I hear so many varied options, the opinions about the dwarven holds. Um, I've played them at the ATC. I played semi decently, just wasn't really happy with my results most of it was just luck and the wrong kind of list but I, I at least I got 60 points <laughs> so I I could at least go to sleep with with honor I do think that the dwarven holes is is a good book in I see a lot of lists in my own meta with the more casual player who are going for the combat dwarf list which I think is awesome they're taking all the runic, runic upgrades on the heroes, big combat blocks, vanguard, seekers, and just go, 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 go. That makes it, the, in the all-around medium, mi middle, and bottle tables, it makes it a powerful army. I think you can get some really big wins with it. On the other hand, I personally think th that the Dwarven Hold book has issues, uh, big issues, uh, points-wise, with certain units. What is pr and it has some problems with certain play styles. Let's let's leave it uh, on that. So I think on the higher level, it's not a really strong book. But I think for the average player, just having fun, it's a really really strong book. It's a really flavorful book. So yeah, that's why I put it in the middle tier. Then we get to the strong tier. I'll start with the Infernal Dwarfs. I still think it's a strong army book. Um, one reason why I've pulled it there is that people still don't know what the Infernal Dwarf book does. Not a lot of people play it, so when you're playing in, a, in your average tournament or in, at your club, 
people are like, oh, I'll just move to those guys with the guns over there, that big block. What's the worst that can happen? And then they just walk into a uh, uh, blunderbuss wall and the unit disappears. Stuff like that. Um, it's not as strong as it was. It, it got quite a solid nerfing in 1.2 and 1.3. Even 1.1. But it's still a powerful book. I think there are a lot of options in the book you can use. A lot of different play styles. It's not that more powerful than the Dwarven Hold book. I think for the average player. But it's easier to to get the nastier list styles. I think just add some of the, the Kadim, Anointed and etc. And it's, it's yeah. That combined with the lack of knowledge of the other players made me put them in a strong tier. Then we got the Highborn Elves. Part of part of me just put them here to just um, fuck with the Highborn players. Oh my god, my army isn't that strong! Yeah, <laughs> yes it is, I said so. No, um... Highborn Elves, just like the Sylvan Elves, just like the Thread Elves, aren't really popular in my meta anymore. Still, uh, Highborn Elves are the most popular compared to the Thread Elves. <laughs> A lot more popular. I put them in a strong category because I think the the average elf player can build a semi-decent army pretty easily. Um, I see everyone playing with the Chariot Lord. Everybody knows that trick. It's it's easy to get information about the Highborn Elf army from the forum. The Highborn players also do a lot of work writing writing tips and strategies for everyone to pick up. So. When I'm playing against a highborn elf player, even though it's just Joe Schmuck from the street, he at least knows how the army works if he just put a little bit of effort in there. Besides that, the army has some standout picks. I want to just want to say sword masters. Sword masters are awesome. I, I know you guys don't feel that they are awesome. Just just wanted to say it. So yeah, I think the highborn elves are a strong army book. Then we get to the Demon Legion. So, I hate the Demon Legion book. Um, just me, personally, I do not like the Demon Legion book. I have two Demon Legion armies, even. I'm not blaming the army book writers, I'm not blaming the Night Age. I just don't look like the way the army plays. That's just me, personal taste. S even besides that, I've played with a pure pestilence list uh, for a couple of tournaments and it's bloody nasty. Really nasty on the if you're playing against your average player who just doesn't see a different solution, just run right into the army. I've seen the change army on the table and it can be really nasty. So much rest output. I've seen the combination lock me with change. Really fast, really nasty, really powerful. Because so many options, I think the Demon Legion is a good book. And it's one I'm better with. I was doubting about putting it in the strong tier because I think my opinion of the high end players of the Demon Legion is our interesting. My opinion about it. Uh, Stack example. So I put it in the strong tier, pretty much. Then we get to the top tier. So there's one thing you can say about all these three arms. They can take a beating and just keep on hitting back. Uh, I think that's what makes them the top tier for the average player. It's probably the same for high players, although I'm doubting about the Ogre cons because so many people have played against them that people are aware of tricks they have at all. But start, um, Vampire Covenant, why in the top tier? Well, one, uh, I just made a, a ridiculous vampire army that works, <laughs> even though it shouldn't because crap is, but it's just powerful. Um, I don't know a lot of vampire players um, in Amazon, I'll be honest. It's army that mostly played by more competitive players for here, but we have some casual players that think wrong with it. Vampires are pretty strong, but it's easy to just look in the way they heal better than Dying Dynasty. The, uh, the characters be bloody nasty, the options for the flying mounted monsters, the cream errors are ridiculous. Um, I'm playing with two of them at the moment, and I'm probably just gonna drop to one, uh, because um, I'm, I'm just I'm just feeling dirty when playing with it, to be honest. If you don't have the tools, which an excellent of the average player will not have, having two of them on the table will destroy you both. Uh, it's just that nasty. The opponent doesn't have a lot of shooting, not a lot of magic, they can just go bad. And go bad. That's been why in the top well, I don't really think about it, everybody knows, everybody is aware of the power level of the Ogre Cons in these turns. 
I almost didn't put these for top tip uh, beyond by the way, because I don't see a lot of average players playing with them. Again, it seems to be an army that the top tier players are are massively moving into. But uh dude it's a really solid army even for the average player because the army is really resilient. You can build big blocks, you can build big monsters and you can just run into the opponent. But you also have some easy tricks to play with. For example the ambushing core, everybody understand how that works and scoring. It makes winning the objectives easier. So yeah. This was my uh, my overview of the current power level of the, all the armies on the average table. I'm really curious. I'm, I'm going to do the same uh, same topic in about six to eight months when we've had a lot of experience with the the newer versions and just see if things are changing, if things are different, if certain armies made a giant swing. I do think personally that a couple of armies are gonna gonna make a big swing. I'm really hoping that the Dread Elves will will rise up and um, prove their metal on the battlefield. And I just hope that the middle tier middle tier just gets bigger and the other tiers get smaller. Alright everybody, uh, I think this is enough for the uh, weekly update. Uh, if you have any comments, feedbacks, please please leave a comment I'll, in, the, in the comment section. I'll try to respond there. If you like the show, please like and subscribe and... Yeah, well, I like likes, I'll be honest. Um, general Night Age news that I should probably mention. Uh, our social media team, our new social media team, so not just me and Markman, will probably start kicking it out uh, right now. So keep an eye on our Facebook, our Twitter and our Instagram. Um, especially the Instagram. It should be a lot more busier in, in the coming weeks. And yeah. Just have fun, play games guys, and just relax. Oh, yeah. Also the ladies. <laughs> this weekend I spent a lot of, quite a lot of time with, uh, with general hobby stuff with the ladies. So always cool to see that they are also finding the way to the night age. Alright everybody, thanks for listening. See you on the next episode of The Orange Road. Bye.